Well, good morning, church. We're so excited to be here with you this morning in worship. Would you stand as we read our call to worship together? It comes from Psalm 57, verses 9 through 11, and it says, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. From the darkness I called your name, and into darkness your mercy came. You called me up, lifted me up, how great is your love. Your love, how great. 
they would no one ever asked it where is the finish line that's the question I want to hear what does mission accomplish look like you can watch videos about North American missionaries like me you can read stories about us you can pray for us but don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end we start churches to make Jesus known we meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finished line looks like. It looks like obedience. Same as your finish line. <laughs> God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your gift, so the any I'm strong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where together we make Jesus known. is your prayer guide for some highlighted missionaries. We do need to pray for all our missionaries, but uh, these have been picked out for this emphasis. So make sure that if you do nothing else, please pray for these people as they go out to make Jesus known. Um, also, you should have envelopes in the backs of the pews if you need those, and you should have had those in your envelopes if you have those mailed to you. So just just be in prayer this morning, and we do have a special speaker. Charles will introduce him in just a minute. Well, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Everyone doing well? You're looking great. Good to see you. Thank you for being here today. If you're a guest, you're very, very special to us. We're glad that you are here. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you, and I know that they're in there this Sunday because I put them all in there this week, all right? Uh, so if you'd be so kind, if you are a guest, fill out a Connect card for us if you don't mind. Let us get a record of your visit. We would love to drop something in the mail to you this week just to thank you for being here with us today. 
and uh, we, w we, won't, we won't hound you all week, I promise you, but we do want to uh, just let you know how glad we are and how thankful we are that you decided to be with us today. It's a beautiful day out there, by the way. You could be anywhere. You could be outside at a park, walking the dog at Starbucks, wherever, uh, or in bed, and, and yet you're here, so thank you. In fact, if, if you're uh, pretty savvy like this, you can just take your phone and put it up to the uh, QR code in, in the, uh, I think in the same spot as the connect card. It'll take you right to where you can sign in digitally and we'll get that record of your visit as well. Uh, we do have some very special guests here today. The pastor of Kingdom City Church, a church that is funded by the North American Mission Board that is about to launch in 2025 in the Chambly area. Uh, and he's got two of his henchmen, I mean his uh, ministry partners with him today. And uh, Blake Odgers is here today. He's going to speak for us. You guys are going to be so excited to hear him. What God's doing in his life, but also in Chambly. And, and very soon, what we're all going to be doing is hearing about the work of uh, Kingdom City Church. Thank you guys for being here today. Really appreciate you all. And our men are going to come forward now, take the morning offering. We've got some more great music. And then we'll get to hear from Blake. All right, Father, we come to you today, God, to thank you for your love and grace. Lord, we thank you that you are, we think of this beautiful eclipse that's going to happen tomorrow. God, we thank you that you're the God of the heaven and the earth. That the heavens declare the glory of God. What a mighty, awesome, and powerful God you are. A God we cannot even fathom how huge you are, how great you are. And so we just proclaim the truth of Deuteronomy that you're the great, the mighty, the awesome God. No one is above you. You are the king of all kings and the God of all gods. As the Old Testament like to proclaim, you're the one true living God. And yet you humbled yourself and you came to us as Jesus, the Son of God. Father, you sent your Son and you, you gave your Son that we might live through his death. And that through his resurrection we might have the truth behind our faith, the validation of our faith, the reality. That you are the resurrection and the life and if we believe in you, we will live forever. God, we have an opportunity this morning to give back a, a little portion of what you've given us, it's something you've asked us to do, and so we gladly do it. Help us, God, to move beyond the obligation of giving, Lord, to, to move to the generosity that is involved in the kind of giving that you practice giving your all Lord, may we give our all to you may we give what we give today may you take it multiply it bless it for your kingdom service God help us to be so cheerful and generous in our giving that we reach far beyond the goal that we've set for this North American Mission Board offering God, today we pray for Blake Odgers and the Kingdom City Church. We pray for his ministry partners here with him today. God, we pray your blessings over them as they launch and reach out to the Shambly area. We pray they would do great things for you, the great, the awesome God. We pray all this. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.
holy. And we're so thankful for this opportunity to worship you this morning. Lord, we pray for Blake as he brings your word before us this morning. We just ask that you would speak to us through him as he brings your word. We love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Can we, uh, can we thank our musicians this morning? Thank you so much for serving us. Well, it's such a privilege to be with you this morning, church. How are you doing? That's awesome. Uh, so, show of hands real quick. Uh, how many of you, when people ask, you say you're from McDonough, Georgia? How many of you, when people ask, you're from McDonough, Georgia? There we go. Well, whether you're from McDonough or McDonough, I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, grateful to be with you this morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Blake Odgers, and uh, I am here with a couple of friends of mine, Paul and Austin, um, who serve on our team at Kingdom City Church. And um, it is just an absolute honor and privilege. Before we walked in, we actually kind of prayed together in the car. And uh, just reflecting on the beauty of the fact that uh, there are across the world there are people every tribe nation tongue gathering around and singing the words that we just sang that there is a holy 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 god who is worth our lives and all of our devotion and um i don't know about you but it encourages me um i don't know what kind of week you may have had this this week or maybe even what kind of week you're anticipating having in the next few days but there's just something about that knowing that as we gather together it's not just the people in this room but that we're not alone. We're not alone. That there are people all around the globe who are with us, who are locking arms with us to push back darkness in various cities, in various villages, in various spaces uh, to say that there's a God who loves his creation, who is on a move to redeem and restore all things for the glory of his name. And uh, I hope that encourages you this morning as much as it encourages me. Uh, Tonight, this evening, I'll be in a living room with... uh, a remnant of people who are uh, on their way to, Lord willing, planting and building what will become Kingdom City Church in the city of Atlanta. And the beauty of that is that the same God who is present here among his saints in Macdonna is the same God who will be present in my living room this evening. And uh, the same God who is seeking to save and redeem. And... Uh, it's a beautiful privilege that it is for us to gather here and worship that God. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm here for a few reasons. Um, first and foremost, Lord willing, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to minister to you this morning. My goal this morning is to be faithful to Jesus and to be helpful to you. Uh, second of all, um, I'm here to obviously preach God's word. The, Jesus promises that if, that if he be lifted high, that he will draw all men to himself. And so this morning, we want to lift Jesus high. We want to see people be drawn into Christ. But, but third, uh, I'm here to honor you and to thank you. And Lord willing to also call you uh, towards more faithfulness and more generosity. Because the reality is, is this is a, a 200-year-old congregation. I mean, God has been faithful for two centuries uh, through these saints. You stand on the shoulders of an entire generation. And there's an entire generation coming behind you that's going to stand on your shoulders because the kingdom of heaven is not going to fall and fade away in our lifetime. It's going to continue to go on into eternity. We're just here for a moment. And, uh, and honestly, the call and the encouragement is simple for us to just keep going, for us to just keep going this morning. Uh, the beauty of of, of the reality of what we're doing right now is that today all across North America there are congregations gathering for the first time. There are churches right now that are gathering for the very first time. That the stage that we're in right now, they just trudge through it, right? That they've they've prayed and they've labored and they've developed and they've called and they've and they've failed in some things and they've learned and now this morning for the very first time they are launching as a brand new church. This morning congregations are gathering for the very first time. There are men and women, boys and girls, coming to faith in Christ this morning all across North America. 
There is darkness being pushed back in various communities and cities, rural, urban, happening right now in North America. Darkness that has previously triumphed and been unchallenged is now being trampled upon and being challenged and being pushed back by the kingdom of light. This morning, the gospel is being preached. This morning, Jesus is being glorified. This morning, the saints are being edified because of churches like yours. Callings like mine exist, and churches like ours exist because of churches like yours who say, we understand that the kingdom doesn't ex exist just of us or just for us, that the gospel isn't something that I'm meant to hoard and hold on to, but it's something that's meant to flow through me to another generation and to other places and people. All because you've been faithful and you're going to continue to be faithful. And the beauty of what we're going to be doing tonight in my living room is as we pray to be a part of a move of God in our city, and honestly a city and a community that isn't looking for one, a city and a community that isn't looking for a new church, a city and a community that isn't asking for that, but one that desperately needs one. We're going to be praying that God would build something out of nothing, opening up God's word and crying out for him to do it again, that the things that we read about, the things that we're going to talk about this morning, we're opening up and saying, God, we want to see you do this again. Right? That we don't believe this is just a book that we're meant to look back on and say, man, wasn't that awesome? We get to look at this book and say, God, you're still the same God who desires to do the same things. Would you do it again? Would you do it again here? Would you do it again among us? Would you do it again through us in our day and in our city? And we are able to do this, all of us, us and you, we are able to do this because we're not alone. And we're not alone because you gather and because churches like you gather and because you pray, and because you give. And 100% of that Annie Armstrong giving that you just saw displayed in that video, 100% of that goes to churches like ours. Goes to people like us. And, um, and that's the beauty of the North American Mission Board. That's the beauty of the SIN Network, is that they're simply a conduit. Because it's a conviction of ours that networks don't plant churches, denominations don't plant churches, churches plant churches. Churches plant churches. And the beauty of this is that right now, everything that's happening across North America, you've got a hand in. There are churches being launched in Boston, Massachusetts right now, that because of your faithfulness and generosity, they're, you're getting to be a part of that. What a privilege and what an honor it is to be used in the mission of Jesus. And so I thank you. My family thanks you, my wife and our 10-month-old son. Uh, our 10-month-old son who has no idea how grateful he is for you. But this morning, this morning had eggs because of you. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we're thankful for you. Kingdom City Church thanks you. The, the, the lost people of our city who have not yet met Jesus but will, thank you. Um, so with that long-winded introduction, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 this morning, and so I encourage you to turn there if you have your Bibles. Um, the question we want to ponder this morning is this, if Jesus has raised from the dead, then what now? If Jesus has raised from the dead, then what now? I trust that you had a, an amazing Easter celebration uh, together and uh, in, in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. And so the question for us is, is, if that is indeed true, if we really believe what we say we believe, then what does that mean for us here and now? I'm going to read uh, the passage starting in verse 1, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and then we're going to dive in. Sound good? Awesome. Uh, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, and after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a, over, a, over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. When he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, You have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? 
And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. It's the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a big and beautiful and awesome God that is not stretched too thin by the fact that there are thousands, if not millions of saints gathering right now asking of you. That, Lord, your arm is long enough. Your hand is big enough. Lord, you have all things. And so, Lord, this morning, we are not afraid to ask much of you because you are a good and generous God. And so, Lord, we ask you this morning, would you meet with us? God, we ask you this morning, Would you reveal yourself to us? God, we ask you this morning, would you convict where we need to be convicted? Would you encourage where we need to be encouraged? But God, more than anything, would you make Jesus big and beautiful in our hearts and in our lives today so that we can be used for you, for your kingdom, for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. So so let's ask ourselves this question this morning. What if Christ had not risen from the dead? What if Christ has not risen from the dead? Have you, ever, have you ever taken a moment to ponder that question? Have you ever taken a moment to truly think about that reality? Unfortunately, uh, there are many people outside these walls today who are living in that reality. Of a reality of, in their minds and in their hearts, a Jesus that they don't know. When it comes to his power and his reality, his presence in their lives, he is still very much dead and buried to them. But have you ever thought about what that would mean for you, what that would mean for us if Jesus had not risen from the dead? Uh, The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 actually allows himself to go there and ask this question. What would it mean if Jesus had not risen from the dead? And he says a few things. He says this, that if, that if Christ has not been raised, then there is no resurrection of the dead. That when we die, we're dead, we're gone. There's no hope for the future. He says our proclamation is in vain if Jesus has not risen from the dead. He said your faith is in vain if he has not risen from the dead. He said we are false witnesses about God. He said actually what we're doing is evil if we're proclaiming something that isn't even true. He said, we're testifying wrongly about God if Jesus has not risen from the dead. Ultimately, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, your faith is worthless. He says, you are still dead in your sins if Jesus has not risen from the dead. He said, those who have died are not just sleeping, they have perished if Jesus has not risen from the dead. We have no hope and should be pitied more than anyone if Jesus has not risen from the dead. That is the reality of a resurrectionless Christianity. That is the reality of a dead and buried Christ who is not alive today. I've heard some people even say before that if Christianity, if if it turned out at the end of my life I found out that Christianity wasn't true, I'd still be glad that I followed Jesus. And I, I understand the heart in that sentiment. I really do. Um... But what's interesting is that Paul says the exact opposite of this. The Apostle Paul says, not me. He goes on to say that if Christ hasn't raised, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Life doesn't matter. Stop making sacrifices for Jesus if he's not alive. Stop counting the cost if Jesus is not alive. Stop fighting against sin if Jesus is not alive. Do whatever it takes to get through life. Medicate, numb, indulge, because life is meaningless. I I don't know about you, but 
I've, I, I have felt this tension before. I have felt this tension before. And what I mean is, is this, that following Jesus is costly, right? Uh, right now, uh, the past few months have been, have been costly in a lot of ways for my family. That there's been moments where we're sitting there and there's, there, there's, there's not really much money. We're overwhelmed by the weight of, of trying to start a church from nothing in a community that doesn't really want one. I've had moments where I'm looking at my wife and our 10-month-old and I'm, and I'm thinking about my responsibility as a husband and as a father. And, and, I, and I've had that moment where when you take so many hits, you just kind of end up looking up to the sky and thinking, man, I really hope that this is true. Like, I really hope that this is true. Um, for Paul's audience, it's, it's, it's very likely uh, that, that, that this could cost them everything. Not just general life comforts, but it could cost them their friends, it could cost them their families, it could cost them their very lives. Not just possible, it was likely that it would cost them their very lives. And I, and I, bet, I bet you felt this tension too. Why? Because I know that following Jesus has probably cost you some things. Right? Like Maybe it's cost you your job. Maybe it's cost you friendships. But for all of us, it's cost us idols and trust structures. There's things we've had to lay down at the feet of Jesus because we believe that this is true. And we've thought in those moments when we're trying to stay faithful to Jesus and it feels like we just keep taking hits, that we had to maybe look within ourselves and look around and go, man, I really hope that this is true. We feel that same tension that Paul felt. Well, if this is not true, then this is all in vain. What are we doing? And I think it's important for us to feel that weight for a moment. But the beauty of this passage is that Paul does not stop there. He doesn't stop with, I hope this is true. He doesn't stop with, what if this is all in vain? He doesn't stop with, what if this is all meaningless? He emphatically states, but indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead. But indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead. Paul Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't say, man, I really hope this is true. I really think that Christ is raised from the dead. I don't know if you've looked into the evidence, but I really do think it's a possibility that Christ... Paul said, I've come face to face with the resurrected Jesus in all of his glory. I don't have to doubt it. I don't have to question it. The resurrection of Jesus is true. Indeed, he has risen from the dead. And and because this is true, life matters. Because this is true, what we're doing here matters. Because this is true, the sacrifices you make out of faithfulness to Jesus matter. Because this is true, we have hope for this life and the life to come. And because this is true, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and God is on the move to make all things new. Because this is true. He tells us Jesus was the first fruits of the new creation. That when Jesus was resurrected, it was the beginning of God's redemption plan to restore all things to himself. Ephesians goes on to tell us that this is the will and the purpose of God to unite all things in heaven and on earth in and under Christ. That this is what we're a part of. This is where we're standing. And we get to stand in the aftermath of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus where we get to proclaim with the Apostle Paul, indeed this is true. Indeed this is true. And this is where Luke opens up in Acts chapter 1, what we just read. Acts is a continuation of Luke's gospel. Luke's the author of both of them, and he's writing to the same person. And it seems like this person, Theophilus, we don't know if that's just a, if that's just a surname or, or whatever that might be, but Luke is writing to someone that has charged him to write about the things of Jesus. And, and it seems like Theophilus was, was, was seeing the things that were happening in the early church. He was hearing stories about the miracles. He was seeing the, the growth and the expansion of the church. He was seeing their perseverance through suffering. And Theophilus was asking Luke, what is all of this? And what's interesting is when he asked Luke this question, Luke didn't just go straight into the book of Acts. Luke started with the gospel of Luke. And he he starts in Luke chapter 1, and he says, Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, talking about the church, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, 
since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write, to write you in orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you've been instructed. He says, he says Theophilus, before I can get into all the things that, that the church is about and all the things that are happening among us, first, you've got to know about Jesus. You've got to understand, I've, I've heard about the things from the very first, and I've done some, some investigation. I've got to tell you about Jesus, because Luke knows that without the life, the death, the burial, the ministry, the resurrection of Jesus, none of this is happening in the early church in Acts. He's saying, Theophilus, none of this makes sense, what's happening among us, if you don't understand Jesus first. So I've got to write to you first about this, Theophilus. And he says, so that you may have certainty about what you've believed. You may have certainty about the things that have been instructed to you. He said, when you get Jesus, everything else kind of comes into line. But you've got to understand Jesus first, Theophilus. And then in continuation of his first letter, Luke picks up just after the resurrection of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. And he says, he says Theophilus, I wrote the first narrative, talking about his gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. We're going to come back to that, but that's a revolutionary word. Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen after he had suffered he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God so Luke writes and he says he says Theophilus I need you to understand that after the resurrection of Jesus Jesus didn't just go away he said that Jesus hung around for a little bit and, and he instructed them about some things. And what did Jesus instruct them on? He instructed them about the same things he instructed them on during his life. The kingdom of God. Except this time, he wasn't talking about the kingdom of God that was, that was at hand and, and we didn't really understand its power. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's saying, now you've seen me be raised from the dead. Do you understand the kingdom of God is at hand? Because you can say the kingdom of God is at hand, but if Jesus is in a tomb, it doesn't really mean much. But when all of a sudden the kingdom of God is at hand and the resurrected Jesus is telling you that the kingdom of God is at hand, all of a sudden you start to believe that maybe the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? And then what Luke is about to describe for the next 28 chapters in the book of Acts is the birth of a movement. And this movement does not happen and it doesn't make sense if you don't first understand that Jesus has raised from the dead. A movement that continues to this day. Did you know you're a part of a movement? Did you know that generations and generations before you, did you know that what you get to be a part of today is locking arms all the way back to Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you are joined in on that movement that long before you were ever here, there was a movement that was birthed. There was a plan at hand, and now you get to be a part of it. A movement was birthed. We now call it the church, but the church was never meant to be simply stagnant. The term of ecclesia, the, the called out ones, it was a missional term that included something. And the church was not even really the end. Jesus' point and purpose wasn't just the church. His point and purpose was the worship of God among the nations. And the church was simply the means to that glorious end. That we're just a means to God's ultimate end. And the movement of the church, the movement of Jesus was birthed, and the church is only the conduit. So the question for us today is, what is the church? What is this movement? What now? And so really simply, I, I, I want to kind of give this working definition for the morning. I'm only here for Sunday, so if you disagree with me, you can get back to the real thing next week. Um, but, but the movement is this. It's the people of Jesus continuing the ministry of Jesus in the power of Jesus until the return of Jesus. It's the people of Jesus continuing the ministry of Jesus in the power of Jesus until the return of Jesus. Can we work with that this morning? Um, so first and foremost, it's the people of Jesus. 
As Jesus appears to his apostles and his disciples, his followers here, he charges them with something. You notice that Jesus doesn't call a certain individual and give them a missional statement. He talks to his people and he says, you will be my witnesses. And so what this means for us, the expectation that Jesus places on us beginning here and the expectation that Jesus continues to place on us today is that everyone has a role to play in this grand mission. That everyone has a role to play in the movement of Jesus to the nations. That everyone has a role to play in his plan in the world. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, in Christ you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, and that means the Holy Spirit is in you. And what does Jesus say is the point and the purpose of the Holy Spirit here? He has many roles. He has many He has many things that he does, but he specifically says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and this Holy Spirit is going to charge you to be my witnesses, that that this Holy Spirit is going to lead you out into a missionary journey, that this Holy Spirit is going to give you a role to play. And the beauty in this, because I don't know if you're standing there and you're thinking, okay, so my role is the same as the the apostles' role. I've got to go do what the apostles did. Here's the beauty of this, is that Jesus gives this commission to his church. So what we're saying here is that together, you and I, we have a role to play in the mission of Jesus in the world. That the Spirit of God is is indwelt in every single believer, and he gifts each of us differently according to his own measure of grace. And so that means you have been gifted, that the Holy Spirit lives within you, and you do have a role to play. And we together can pursue this mission of Jesus together. And the beauty of this is that it's the people of Jesus, and it's in a particular place and in a particular time. So when Jesus charges the apostles with this movement, he talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if he were standing here today, and he was about to send out of McDonough, Georgia, he would tell you to take it to McDonough, and to Metro Atlanta, and to Georgia, and to the ends of the earth. And so what is he saying? He's saying, whoever you are as the people of Jesus, you have a responsibility to this mission where you live. He's saying, take this, my people. Here's our mission together. We have a role to play in this together. And you know how freeing that is, that as as someone who's who's seeking to lead a church and to be a pastor, that all that doesn't fall on me. Because can I tell you this? I'm not that great. I'm gifted in very few things. Very few things. And that's the beauty of, of, of even this church planting journey is, is thankfully I don't have the audacity to try to do it on my own. And I've actually got friends around me. I don't, I don't know if I suggest planting a church with your friends. Um, it's a humbling experience. Um, but they're not really that impressed with me. They're just not. And they let me know it. They let me know it. Because they've seen me. They've been walking with me. They know me. They know I'm gifted in an area or two, Lord willing. And guess what? I've walked with them, and I know them, and I know they're gifted in a lot of areas that I'm not gifted in. I need them. I don't just want them. I need them. And you're needed. Have you thought about that? I know that deep within every human heart, there's a desire for us to be needed. There just is. And can I tell you this? You are. You're needed. You're needed here. There are people out there that need you. There are people in here that need you. You're needed. There's a role for you to play. First and foremost, we're the people of Jesus. We're the people of Jesus. Second, we're the people of Jesus continuing the ministry of Jesus. So you have a role to play, but what is this What is this mission that we're talking about? Luke uses a very interesting phrase here. He says that Jesus began something. Jesus began something. That's pretty extraordinary to think about. I know for some of us, we probably read that and we go, yeah, but didn't Jesus say it is finished? Right? What was Jesus saying when he said that? He said, he said the payment required for my, God to be ple- for, for my Father to be pleased with you is, is paid. It's finished. That you don't, you don't have to pay anything. You can come to him by faith and God can forgive you because the payment has been paid it's been satisfied so that is finished but the mission of Jesus was just getting started and Luke says the office he said he said listen you got to understand this Jesus was just beginning something 
When Jesus talked about his kingdom is at hand, he wasn't saying, hey, the end is here. He was saying, this is a new beginning is here. That, that God is on a mission to make all things new, to redeem and restore all things. And don't you look outside, don't you ride down your street and think, man, Lord, you need to make some things new. I know for me, just the ride, just a mile ride from my front door to the interstate that I have to get on, I get overwhelmed with grief. I get overwhelmed with grief. And I've prayed those prayers driving down that road going, God, don't you see? Don't you see, Lord? Don't you see all this? God, would you make this new? Would you redeem this? Would you do something here? And I know for you, you feel that every day. It may be in your family. It may be in your friends. It may be in your workplace. It may be driving along these same roads, but you feel that. Lord, would you make all things new? And the beauty of this is that that work has begun in Jesus. That he is making all things new and that we get to continue that ministry, that work of him making all things new, that we get to be partners with him in the renewal of all things. That we get to make this world a little bit more at home for the, for the person of Jesus to return. That we don't, we're not just throwing this world out, saying, God, would you get us out of here? We're saying, Lord, we want to go ahead and prepare things for your return. We want to make it look more like your domain up there. We want to make it more like this down here. That's what Jesus prayed. On earth as it is in heaven. That in a very real sense, we're seeking to pursue the mission and the ministry of Jesus so that we can be an answer to the prayer of Jesus that he, w- that he would make the earth more like heaven. Because the more God's dominion spreads, the more his rule and reign spreads, the more redemption and renewal spreads. The more people are made whole. And this is what Jesus is saying, that, when, that why is the Spirit of God in you? The Spirit of God is in you so that you'll receive power to continue this ministry that Jesus did, that you'll be a witness. And what is a witness? A witness is someone who has seen and heard something and then testifies about what they've seen and heard. And the beauty of this is what did Jesus say he came to begin? He came to begin something that he was doing and that he was teaching. That there's things he's done and there's things he said, and now we as his people get to share the things he's done and the things he said, not only in this book but also in our lives. That we get to be witnesses, that we've seen God do some things. We've heard God say some things. And now we get to spread that message out to the world. We get to continue what he started. Think about this. That something that Jesus began, you get to be in direct line of. That you get to continue generationally. Romans 8 talks about Jesus being the firstborn of many sons and daughters. That he was the first and we get to be in that family and continue that mission. The ministry of Jesus to usher in the kingdom of heaven on earth for the sake of redeeming, renewing, and restoring all things. You and I get to be a part of that. So we're continuing the ministry of Jesus. As we proclaim his message, people, are, people come to faith in Christ. They're discipled. They, they get a little bit more whole. And we get to spread wholeness rather than brokenness as Jesus redeems people. And those people go out and redeem things. In the power of Jesus... Where the people of Jesus continue in the ministry of Jesus and the power of Jesus. Jesus tells them, you've got to wait for the Spirit. You cannot do this in your own power. And what is this power? It's not just any power. He says, this is the very life of Christ. This is, the very, this is his very life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that is living within you if you are in Christ. The very power of Christ living in you and accessible to you that you may continue the life and ministry of Christ. That you have power within you. And I think there's so many of us that there's power within us that's untapped. Because the reality of this power of the Spirit of God is that he, he gets ignited as we walk in obedience and faithfulness. That there's a lot of us, we want to feel strong in order for us to be obedient. And it's actually in our obedience, in our weakness, that the Spirit grows in power and strength. And we get led more and more and more into greater strength and greater strength and greater strength. That the Spirit partners with our obedience to make us whole in Christ and to make us more active in the life of Christ in the world. He's not saying, he's saying, man, you wait for the Spirit. If you're in Christ, guess what? You don't have to wait anymore. You have the Spirit. Now we can go. Now we can get after it. If you're in Christ, the Spirit's in you. And we can get after it together. And why do we need this power? Jesus says you got to have power, but why do we need this power? Well, there's an enemy. 
there's an enemy. I think there's a lot of times we, we take the enemy out of the story. Even when we preach the gospel at times, I think we, we maybe go back to the beginning of all things and we talk about man's rebellion, but we don't remind ourselves that there was an enemy in that garden. That behind sin, behind rebellion, behind the brokenness is an enemy. This is why the Apostle Paul says we don't war against flesh and blood. There's principalities and darkness. And when we stand here and we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim the life of Jesus, we proclaim the resurrection of Jesus, we are pushing back darkness in this place. And we do the same thing out there. There's an enemy, but we've got a power greater than our enemy. There's sin. There's sin. We need power to overcome sin. We need power to overcome sin. There's sin in our hearts, sin in our lives. And as as we're more conformed to the image of Jesus, it's getting rid of that sin in our lives. And we need power to do that. We can't just behave better. We've tried, right? We need a cure. We need healing to happen. We need transformation to happen. That happens by the power of the Spirit. We've got self. Self. You know, I I heard somebody say one time that, uh, you know, we can't can't love God or love others better until we love love ourselves better. I was like, I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't need help loving myself. I got a lot of love for me. I don't hold myself accountable at all. And the reality is, is self has idols. Self loves security. Self loves safety. Self loves wealth. Self loves greed. Self loves comfort. Self loves a lot of things. There's self, and we need power to overcome self. There's stuff. Just stuff. One of my favorite parables that Jesus preaches, he says in the parable of the sower, he says that the seed gets sown, and he said, stuff, thorns and thistles grow around the seed and choke it out. And Jesus said, this just represents stuff, other things. How easily we get distracted. There's just a lot of stuff in life, a lot of stuff in this world. And it's easy for us to get distracted. We need power to live for the things that matter most, and they're suffering. They're suffering. The interesting part about this passage is the word witnesses is, in the Greek, literally martyr. The call to be a witness for Jesus, it comes with suffering. And it's understanding that, hey, we're at war with the world. And it's for the sake of the world. We're at war with an enemy who has dominion and darkness. There's going to be suffering. Most of the people that this is written to and written about, would lay their lives down for Jesus. And I know for you that following Jesus has cost you some things, and there's been some suffering. And we need power to keep going. And the interesting thing is that Jesus said it would be better that he went so that the Spirit could come. Rather than being confined to one's place, the Spirit has been unleashed to the whole world through the people of Jesus. And the Spirit has gifted each and every single one of you for the sake of the mission of Jesus among you and in your city. And whatever you're going through right now, and it's real, you have power today. If you are in Christ and the Spirit is in you and you have power today and you can keep going for the sake of Jesus. And how long do we keep going? Lastly, until he returns. Until the return of Jesus. It's, it's interesting that the, the apostles actually asked Jesus, is this the time? Now that you're alive, Jesus, is this the time that you're going to restore all things? And Jesus said, hey, that's not for you to figure out, but I'm going to give you a mission. But the beauty of this is that as Jesus, after Jesus ascends, there's a promise made to him that hey, made to them that hey, he's going to come back the same way you saw him leave. So Jesus, in one moment, says, "Hey, I don't want you just standing here looking up to the sky waiting on me to get back. You got a job to do. You got a mission. You got a purpose. You got meaning. My spirit is in you, and you're and, and there's lifeblood in your veins because you've got a purpose in your life." And it's to take my gospel to the nations. And then as he leaves, there's two men that make a promise. They said, hey, he's going to come back. He's going to come back. Have you ever thought about the fact that the church is forever because it's the bride of Christ, but our mission is temporary? Our mission is temporary. One day, 
the mission of God will be fulfilled. His glory will be seen among the nations. One day, his, his glory will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Our mission is temporary, but his bride is forever. You belong to him and he belongs to you. You are sealed and safe and secure in him. But while we're here and we've got breath in our lungs, we have a mission, and it's only for a little while because one day you'll be in his presence, whether it's because we've gone there or because he's come here. And let me tell you this. Don't you want him to find you faithful? Don't you want him to find you faithful? I love that the two men say, what are you doing standing here looking up? He's coming back. Let's go. Let's go. And the reality is that Jesus leaves the details around his return relatively unclear. But he makes his mission abundantly clear. He leaves the details surrounding his return relatively unclear, but he makes his mission abundantly clear. And so the question for us today as we close is this, what does that mean? What now? Because here's the reality of this, is that this means something for you personally. This means something for you. And I don't know what this means for you. That's something where you've got to work that out with the Lord. But maybe for you in this place, you need to put your faith in Jesus today. Maybe for you, you've been, you've been living in a resurrectionless world. And you need to have a resurrected Jesus sitting on the throne of your heart as king for your, over your life today. Maybe you need to receive his spirit and find purpose and meaning for your life today. Maybe you need to activate your faith in Jesus today. Maybe you're here and you believe, but you're still look, looking up into the sky waiting, existing. And you need to get going after your calling today. Maybe you simply need to be encouraged in your faith today. And I want to tell you just to keep going. That Jesus is worth it. His mission is worth it. He's coming back for you to keep going. Maybe you're tired. Keep going. This means something for us as a church. How many of you need to know that God's not done with First Baptist Church McDonough? That God still has a glorious future for his church. And God has a role for this community in it. There's a world out there that needs you. And God's not done with you. God has a role for you, church. Lastly, this means something for the world. Do you know God is still saving today? Do you know God's still saving today? Do you know that there's hope for the world today? And that no one has to exist without meaning and purpose. No one has to perish. He says that he's come that all may come to the knowledge of truth, right? This means something for the world. It means something for you. It means something for us, and it means something for the world. To quote the great Annie Armstrong, what a glorious thing it is to be a co-worker with God in winning the world for Christ. What a glorious thing it is to be a co-worker for, with God to win the world for Christ. So church, I just want to encourage you. Jesus is alive. We are the people of Jesus, continuing the ministry of Jesus and the power of Jesus until the return of Jesus, and he's going to come back. May he find you faithful. May he find us faithful. And may he renew and redeem and restore all things in this community and in the world for the glory of his name. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you are a God who has started something, and you are a God that is continuing something in and through your people. Lord, that we get to lock arms with the person of Christ himself and the power of his very spirit, and we get to continue what he started for the glory of your great name. Lord, you are building your church. You promised to build your church. You promised that the gates of hell would not overcome your church. And so, Lord, we pray the power of Jesus in his spirit in the lives of every single person in this space and in this room. God, for those who maybe were tempted to give up, maybe for those who are tired, maybe for those who are weary, maybe for those who... Have, have lost a little bit of hope, Lord, would you restore that today in the name of Jesus? Would you give them just a fresh vision of your love and of your mission and of your purpose in the world, God? I pray that you would bless the work of their hands in this community, Lord. I pray that the people of McDonough, Georgia, I pray that the people of Metro Atlanta, I pray that the people, wherever they have influence, Lord, would you bless the work of their hands? 
God, may they see the fruit of their labor. God, there's a harvest that is plentiful, Lord. Would you bless the work of their hands, God, as they are faithful to you. Father, we're here to serve you, King Jesus. May your kingdom come and your will be done here as it is in heaven, in McDonough as it is in heaven, in every single one of our hearts as it is in heaven, in every single one of our homes and neighborhoods as it is in heaven, in our city as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. Let's stand together and pray. And as the Lord lays upon your heart to do what he wants you to do today, we pray you'll be faithful. And maybe to come forward to join our fellowship or to say, Pastor Charles, I gave my life to Jesus. What do I do next? It might be to leave this place and to go into the world and to share this gospel till Jesus returns might be a brand new mission you know of like these young men have discovered in Atlanta. Whatever it is, whatever the Lord lays upon your heart, don't turn him away. Take a step of faith forward. He'll take the rest, but take that step of faith forward. See what God does. As he leads you, you respond. be seated for just a moment. I wanted to introduce you today to a young man. What's your last name, Blake? Calhoun. Calhoun, that's right. To Blake Calhoun. I said that's right, like in case you didn't know. Yeah, that's, that's what. But uh, Blake Calhoun is coming to join our fellowship today. He has confessed Christ as his Savior and Lord. He's been baptized, and he just would like to join our fellowship. In fact, you're pretty sweet on somebody at, at, at First Baptist Church, aren't you? Come on down, Lydia. Blake and Lydia are going to be getting married in January, and we're so happy for you guys. And we're super happy today that Blake has come, come forward to join our fellowship. If you celebrate this decision in Blake's life today, would you say, welcome home? That's good. I like it. Good job, everybody. Y'all are pretty well trained at doing that, man. I love it. It sounds so beautiful to hear, though. Uh, weren't, you, weren't you inspired by Blake Odgers today and his friends who've come with him? Let's thank them for being here with us. Blake is young. He's tall. He's handsome. I can't stand him. Can't stand him. But... Uh,
But uh, no, thank you so much, Blake, for being here today. We, we are praying for, for Kingdom City Church. We just pray God will just uh, blow up that community with your ministry. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you guys for taking the time to be here today. We'll be praying for you guys tonight. Oh, it's been a good day, hasn't it? Lydia, it's been a good day, hasn't it? Yeah, Blake is coming on board to join us. You're one step closer. You're one. There's time. There's time, Blake. There's time. No, okay. No, yeah, lock him in, exactly. Uh, we're, so, we're so happy for you guys, though, and we're happy for us that you get to come on board and join us and that God has brought you to us. What a, what a wonderful thing. And I pray, we'll, as I told Blake, I pray we'll be the church that he needs for this time in his life and that he'll jump in where he feels God is, is leading him and calling him. So let's commit to doing that, all right? Uh, and we want Liddy to be around here for a very long time, don't we? Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to commit to that for sure. But... Uh, I think that's all we have to do today. I know that our joyful bunch is going to, on Thursday, to uh, Buckner's. Oh my gosh, have you had that fried chicken at Buckner's? Ugh. All right, so they're going to be going to, now the, the worship guide has a little bit of the details uh, just a little bit off, right? I mean, it, it kind of depends So how you look at it. But here's what's actually going to happen. At 11 o'clock, the bus is going to be leaving uh, the church. And at 11.30, we will meet there. So everybody, if you're driving yourself there, be there by 11.30. If you want to take the uh, church bus with the rest of the group, make sure you're here. I'd say 10.45, get here early. I came one time to take the bus with the seniors. I got here at 10.40. They were all sitting on the bus. And when I got on, they go, now we can leave. I got another 20 minutes, people. No, no, no. If you're early, you're, you, you might be late. So, so be there about 1045. That, that, that would make everybody happy. Uh, but we're hope, uh, we hope you have a great week uh, this week. Has everybody had fun being off the, the, the uh, spring break? Uh, some folks are still out. We hope to see them next Sunday. Again, Blake and guys, thank you so much for being with us today. I think, uh, is anything else? Did we miss anything? <laughs> The, uh, the, all the activities uh, pick up again this week, so uh, come be a part of our, our Wednesday midweek worship as well. Let's stand together, and Lydia, why don't, why don't you and Blake sing a duet, huh? No, 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 no. no. Why don't we uh, sing no, that we, last, we won't that do last that. verse we won't do of that how deep to Blake. the Father's love together? <laughs> the last <laughs> verse, the last verse. I will not boast in anything, no gifts. No power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his Amen. We hope you have a great week.